Modern GPS units are very accurate and IFR rated GPS units with WAS or Wide Area Augmentation System are even more so. Not only can they determine our position over the ground, but also our altitude above it. This is how we can do many GPS approaches with both lateral and vertical guidance the same way we do in ILS. But not all GPS approaches incorporate vertical guidance into them. This one, into Bay Bridge, Maryland, is an LNAV, lateral navigation. It doesn't have vertical guidance. Still, a WAS-enabled unit can produce a simulated glide path for advisory purposes only to allow us to fly a constant descent on final approach. But without official guidance from the FAA, how is this descent path determined? It's produced by Jeppesen and provided to GPS manufacturers. It's computed based on the FAA's vertical descent angle from the threshold crossing height. Jeppesen approach plates will include a dashed line down to the missed approach point that indicates a vertical descent angle. Here, it's computed as 3 degrees. The vertical descent angle is something computed by the FAA, but the full glide path and the course it follows is something only found on Jeppesen. Flying this LNAV approach with advisory vertical guidance, we cross the final approach fix ASLAM at 1600 feet and start down on the approach. The pink diamond of the advisory glide path takes us down at that 3 degree slope. Notice the intermediate step down fix at ZITP at 740 feet. The descent angle we're on allows us to cross Zipi and satisfy the altitude. Still, we're responsible for making sure we meet minimums, so be prepared to alter your descent or even disable the autopilot if anything looks off. All advisory glide paths are designed to meet these intermediate step-down altitude restrictions. But what if the altitude restriction at Zipi was higher than 740? We wouldn't be able to use a single continuous angle from the final approach fix all the way down without busting minimums. When this is the case, such as here on the RNAV into runway 23 at Frederick, notice the final approach fixes at Shuey, but the dotted line of the advisory glide path doesn't begin there, but at a point 4.3 miles from the runway, and it's steeper than the normal 3 degrees. This allows us to fly the same descent angle and cross Zytum at 1,020 feet. We won't need to destabilize our approach and change the descent angle on final. If we started the glide path at the final approach fix, we'd bust the step down at Zytum. There's no way to draw a straight line from Shuey at 1900 feet to the missed approach point at the MDA without busting at Zytum, so we just delay the descent. This can be confusing when you're flying because you're so often used to starting a descent at the final approach fix, and it can leave you wondering if there's something wrong with your GPS or autopilot setup. The FAA plate doesn't help much because you don't see anything about the delayed start to the advisory glide path because again, the FAA doesn't design the advisory glide path. However, you do get a clue by looking at where the FAA places the vertical descent angle. Here it's after Zytum, showing that the angle only applies after the Zytum fix. It doesn't apply to the segment from Shuey. If it did, you'd find the symbol placed here just after the final approach fix. Advisory glide paths require some additional knowledge such as this to make them work for you in flight. Don't treat them like any other official vertical guidance like you would on an LPV or ILS, and still make sure you're meeting all minimums just like on a non-precision approach. Higher than standard temperatures can cause you to run afoul of some of these altitude restrictions even when flying the advisory glide path, but that's a topic for another video. In the meantime, head over to Flight Insight at the link here or in the description and check out our full ground schools to keep your training going.